This video is a recording of a panel from the event Story Crafting Sessions Fantasy, a free one-day virtual conference hosted by the Weeknight Writers Group in partnership with Renaissance Press. To learn more about the Weeknight Writers Group, you can go to businessforauthors.com slash weeknight dash writers. And to learn more about Renaissance Press, you can go to pressesrenaissancepress.ca. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan Fitzgerald, and we are here on a panel to talk about food. Uh, naming conventions and epistolary, so letters, messages, ravens, telegrams, smoke signals, however people communicate long distance in the world. And I'm joined by uh, Mike Roberti, uh, Lex Vronick, and as Dolkert uh, and Angela Board. Unfortunately, Tori Gross couldn't make it today. Um, we're going to start with some introductions. So uh, panelists, when I call you, please say, up oh, here comes the cat. <laughs> please say your name. Um, your pronouns, uh, why in particular you are here on this panel. And if you'd like to mention what book or books you'll be talking about, that'd be a good chance to do that. Uh, Mike, go ahead. Sure, I'm uh, Mike Roberti. Um, I chose uh, to sign up for this panel because world building is a passion of mine, uh, both as a writer and as a DM. I like to think about cultures. I like to think about, you know, how do different um, ideas interact across distances. My book, The Traitors We Are, is set in a world where writing disappears when the author dies, and uh, it tends to put a damper on, you know, the letters and the epistolary, so I thought that'd be a good fit. Excellent. Uh, Angela? Um, so I am a, uh, I write really large epic fantasy books. Fortune's Fool, you can't see it because I blurred my background, but that's that's my book. That was the Spiff of Five finalists. And I signed up for this panel because I like world building a whole lot. And I also was interested in, um, I think people know my books a lot because of the food in them, but I also liked that we the panel included things like naming characters and letters and all the little tiny details that kind of, you know, feel somewhat, they might feel somewhat extra, except they really build a world. So they're not really extra at all, in my opinion. So anyway, that's why I'm here. Thank you. And Noah? Hi, I'm uh, Noah Beta Haron. I publish under the name NS Dolkart. Um, I, um, I write epic fantasy mostly. And uh, the books, I'll be talking about five books because there's the trilogy that is published, there's the work in progress, and there's the recently, uh, fin well, not so recently finished book that uh, is still in the sort of twilight of submissions process. Um, <laughs> so um, my my published trilogy, uh, the God Surfs series, uh, Silent Hall, Among the Fallen, and A Breach in the Heavens uh, are all um, have, have <laughs> they're, they're a big proper epic fantasy with way too many names. Um, so I, I had to come up with techniques for inventing new names that would uh, work for me and my world and sound cool and not just be, um, variances on real names spelled funny um so it i was attracted to the name the name thing uh and also i i love putting in just like a totally different style of of writing now and then um which epistolary and things like that allow for that's great thank you and lex uh, hi i'm lex um i write mostly horror um I'll be talking a lot about a lot of different WIPs I have going on. Um, I don't have, I have mostly short stories published right now, um, but I'm here because I, world building is one of my favorite parts of writing. I feel like even in a regular contemporary book, you learn so much about the people in them by what they're eating, what they're saying, what their names are, what their backgrounds are, and translating that into fantasy can really help root people into your world. Excellent, thank you. And I should also mention, I am a fantasy writer, but we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about uh, our panelists. Uh, before we go any further, I wanna mention that this event is sponsored by Renaissance Press. That is a Canadian publisher dedicated to publishing, supporting and uplifting marginalized authors. Uh, thanks to their generosity, we've been able to include uh, live captions with this panel and you can find a link to Renaissance in the chat. Uh, let us get started. 
Um, first, I want to ask, uh, and we're going to start this time with uh, Angela. Uh, why do you think food is such a good vehicle to build a fictional world? Why food? Um, well, I guess, you know, mostly I think, um, like I was kind of saying before the panel started, it's really relatable. You know, we all eat. So um, the things and the things that we eat are often very personal and they're connected to our family backgrounds, our culture, um, foods connected to different you know, your social class or, you know, in, in a fantasy world, like nobles eat very differently from people who can't afford the same kind of food. And when you're building a world, um, I enjoy food a lot. And I also like to cook. So it's kind of one of those like little details that I think of also, um, because oftentimes when I'm trying to build a scene, I do like to have my characters eat and, and it kind of, when I'm reading a book and the characters never eat at all, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't know, I'm a mom. It makes me kind of nervous. I'm like, but they eat some food, you know? So <laughs> I find it, but it's a nice way to kind of slow, slow down when you have a scene where you need something, you need a lot of things, you know, you need the characters to relate to each other, you need to build their histories, you need to build a world all at the same time, and then you give them a meal, and what they're eating and how they respond to it and how they deal with the characters in the scene over it can be really, um, it can perform a lot of functions all at the same time. And since you got the mic, uh, why don't you tell us about one particular dish uh, or meal that's in one of your books and, um, you know, what inspired it? Um, maybe have you ever made it yourself? What does it tell us about the world? Okay, so for this question, I was thinking about that. And um, my world is very, it's a Renaissance inspired, um, Italian Renaissance inspired. So they do kind of have opinions about food. But um I think probably the most memorable food scene actually does it has to do in the book has to do with uh, nothing that most people probably want to eat um, because uh, in Fortune's Fool, and this is probably the most memorable um, food scene in any of my books, my, my WIPs included, but um, one of the characters, the main character wants to play a joke to kind of get back at another character. And so um, it's a silk growing region in Northern Italy and she knows a lot about it and he doesn't, and they eat fried silkworms. And so she takes him and introduces him to, you know, the uh, delicacy of fried silkworms to get back at him. And she thinks it's fine. It, doing the research for that was kind of interesting because I had to, you know, Google, can you eat silkworms? And yes, like people do, like if you've got all these cocoons, because like, silk is made from the cocoons and you just chuck the actual larvae out and it's, but, you know, people, a lot of people around the world eat insects because they're a good source of protein. So, um, in a world where you need to make the most of everything you've got, then people eat them. So um, yeah, so I researched how to make silkworms, fried silkworms, and, and what kind of wine went with them. And it turns out it's red. So if you ever have occasion, get a nice red. I would not have guessed that. Yeah, well, me either, <laughs> but it's true, I, according to the internet anyway. And I just happened to have read that book, and I agree that scene is uh, pretty fabulous. Uh, Noah, tell us about... Um, why you think food is so important to, to build a fictional world and oh, uh, while, while you're at it, uh, tell us about something that they eat in your books. So I, I, I love food and I love food as a world building thing and I love food to eat and I love food to make. Um, and the thing about food is that not only do we all experience it, but it is such a big part of our lives. Like it, so much of our lives revolve around eating and um, certainly you like as a Jewish person who person who fasts for 25 hours every year, like you learn while fasting for Yom Kippur, not just how important food is, but also how much of your life revolves around food preparation, food like table setting, like all of these things. Suddenly you have endless time 
when you're when you're not eating right when you're not eating and you're not preparing food like all of a sudden there's just like infinite amounts of time in your day um, because so much of our lives revolve around food right so um so i love including food and and talking about it because it's it's huge right and it's not just good food right good food matters and mediocre food is a big part of our lives and like really bad food experiences are also like and anyone can relate to them um so certainly the the book in which i write the most about food is the one that is currently sort of nearing the end of a submissions process it's called the cowards the cowards war um and it's about this young man who is drafted into the military to fight against the crusaders but who uh is in his heart, he wants to be a stay-at-home dad, um, the way his own disabled father is. And um, so he finagles a way out of the front lines by uh, finding his way into the, into the cook's unit. Um, and so he is, you know, part of the process of producing this god-awful army food. Um, and a lot of his, a lot of his uh, ambition revolves around, you know, rising up the ranks of the cook so that he can get to cook better things um, so that he can, you know, so, 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 you know, because it starts out with him having to eat it, you know, and then it's, you know, it's burnt rice and just God awful things. Um, and his, uh, he, he comes from home with, with a, uh, with dried mushrooms in a in a pouch that are very expensive that his mother who is a uh, a personal chef to to a nobleman um, you know goes out there and you know gets him these very expensive mushrooms and uh, they turn out to be also you know part of the of the solution to to winning the day against the against the crusaders and and uh, rescuing his unit after it's captured, but it's like, you know, so, so his, his, um, maybe the most memorable scene is when a, um, a, a rival cook, uh, tries to sabotage him by, uh, by throwing like a handful of gravel into his bag of lentils before, before he, um, cooks them. And he doesn't realize it until he's pouring the lentils into the boiling water. Um, and he uh, refuses either, right? The idea is that either he'll have to serve that and he'll get in trouble because people are gonna break their teeth or else uh, he's gonna have to throw out the pot and get in trouble for throwing out, you know, perfectly good lentils, et cetera, you know, setting, setting them back, you know, 20 minutes, et cetera. Right, so um, so he decides instead to borrow a sieve from a baker friend and to try to pick them out. Um, and he's burning his hands as he does it, but he refuses to let you know to to either waste the food or let the um, or or let uh, anybody hurt themselves on <laughs> on these lentils that are that are laced with with gravel. So he's, he's burning his fingers and picking out the rocks and scooping up more in the sieve and doing it again. Um, and he ends up uh, with the worst of both worlds because on the one hand, yes, he ends up with a meal that people can eat. But on the other hand, he is now disabled for like a week or two <laughs> with the burns on his fingers and he still gets in trouble. That's fantastic. And I love how not only is food world building, but it's also character building in that case. Uh, I'm extremely curious to know from a horror perspective, uh, how do you deal with food? Uh, Lex, do you deal with it in a horror way or, or other ways? And is there a particular food you'd like to talk about? Yeah, so for me, a lot of it is about, because um, I'm not a huge fan of eating scenes or of describing food itself. And I never have been, I don't really know why. Um, but what I do like is the acts of preparing the food, having characters make the food, together or for somebody else um, or the conversations that happen around a meal. So a lot of it is for character building. Um, one instance that I can think of in particular, um, I have a kind of island zombie apocalypse story 
um, centered around a pair of sisters. And there's an early scene when they're kind of realizing what's happening around them and they're cooking a stew together, but they don't have all the ingredients that they typically would have because they're in an apocalypse situation. You can't just run out to the store and they're kind of just scrappy cooking, figuring things out and coming to terms with their reality. Um, so it's less the food is incorporated, um, the cooking is incorporated, but it's more about these two kind of slowly coming to a realization that our world is not the world that we lived in anymore. And the food is a, kind of like a symbol of that. We can't eat the way that we used to eat. We can't cook the way that we used to cook. Right, I mean, scarcity is a kind of a world building detail as well anyway, yes. even if it's not about the specific foods that you could eat. Uh, did they eat anything? You said they were uh, in a post-apocalyptic setting. Was it, uh, did I hear you say island or did I miss here? Oh no, it's an island, yeah. Okay, did they eat anything special that they found on the island that they wouldn't have otherwise eaten? Um, they're pretty much just kind of figuring out um, what wild herbs they can eat um, or what could potentially hurt them. Um, there's quite a few fishing scenes and a lot of kind of relearning how to live off the land. Excellent, uh, how about you, Mike? Uh, sure. So um, kind of riffing off a few of things I heard, um, I think, you know, we find commonality in food, but a lot of times also we, we explore our differences and, you know, the class struggle um, in food. In my book, The Traders We Are, in chapter two, um, one of the point of view characters is the king's nephew, and um, he's complaining about his food and his scribe, because in my world, you know, scribes for uh, nobles are very important because if they happen to die, um, everything that they've had to had written down or everything that's important has to be uh, transcribed. Um, you know, says, well, you know, sir, this is this is better food than what I eat back home. And he just can't believe it. And he asks to eat what the other soldiers eat. And um, that is something called black bread. And I kind of got inspiration from um, I was like, you know, what would be like the absolute worst thing to eat for breakfast? And I thought it would be uh, biscotti, but not a biscotti, just like a really dry loaf of bread that was uh, like all the moisture is just completely gone. And, um, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll eat that tomorrow. And then he's kind of regretting his decision. Um, and then later on in the book, um, you know, there's a, a struggle going on between a very poor region that is the um, a little bit of the breadbasket of the country. Um, you know, they produce the food, but they don't really have the means to buy the spices or the things that would make the uh, make the food fancy. And uh, he's eating with a, uh, a woman from that region. And she is really upset and somewhat surprised by the way they present the food. You know, it's uh, it's kind of over over spiced. It's a little bit you know different than you'd expect. It kind of shows that, um, you know, even though food is something that we all have in common, sometimes like I mean, I don't know, if, like what I'm, you know, I'm an Italian American, um, and I live in the South, and sometimes people give me Italian food, and I have to kind of you know nod and smile and say, oh yeah, that's uh, that's how my grandma made it too. You know, and I, I think we. Um, we all have that moment where we're like, oh, no, but you have to smile and you have to eat it, you know? Yeah, it definitely shows a lot about the culture. I'm also fascinated that every single answer showed food, not just as a world building detail, but as a character building detail. So I like how all those things kind of link in together. Uh, we can't move on past food, though, without at least talking for a moment about, about beverages. Um, anyone have a particular beverage, whether it's alcoholic or otherwise, they'd like to share? Maybe uh, Noah? Uh well, in uh, in the thing I'm working on now, uh, they there it, it's become a newfangled thing to to drink kvass, which is a um, an Eastern European beverage uh, traditionally made out of fermented bread. Um, and so the thing is that that my my location is more of a France like place, um, and so it's it's like a it's a fad that has that has moved to, you know, because some noblemen came along and, you know, with a, with a retinue from, from some other country and introduced them to Kvass, now like everybody's trying to do it, but there's a, like a bunch of the establishments that, that make it don't really do a great job. So um, I, have a, I have a character who's developed a taste for it, um, but, you know, so he goes to these Kvass houses, you know, like, meeting as a, as a meeting place because they tend to be crowded um, and you know people are you know it's, it's loud enough there are plenty of witnesses in case somebody tries to kill you <laughs> and, uh, and uh, he, you know he, he finally tastes their cross he's like oh this kind of sucks <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me a bit about uh, Mike's uh, 
description of uh, eating Italian food in the South. <laughs> uh, Lex, what about you? What do they drink on the islands? Must be hard to get, get water. Yeah, yeah. And that one, I don't really focus a lot on drinks. Um, some of them are hoarding alcohol as I feel like a lot of people would probably do in an apocalypse. As people situation. are doing now. <laughs> yes, as we have seen. Um, I do have one um, sort of coming of age slasher kind of story that I'm working on right now um, where it's a bunch of teenagers that go to this abandoned house on Halloween and they find a wine cupboard um, in the basement and kind of want to feel, they're just coming from a party where it was all jungle juice and cheap beer and they kind of want to feel they're seniors, they're about to graduate, they want to feel more elevated. So they're trying to open these wine bottles, but can't figure out the corkscrews and different things like that. Oh, that's classic. Uh, how about you, Mike? Uh, yeah, so um, one of the cultures, uh, it's a place called the Aragon Reach. Um, they're in a struggle with the, um, with the, the crown, the, you know, the nobility and the, uh, the, you know, the, the real power players of the country. And um, their thing is that they drink either defeat beer or victory beer, depending on what happened the day before. So um, if they win, they drink something that's kind of like a sweeter pale ale. I kind of picture it being, I think I described it as piney with uh, kind of like a maltiness. If it's defeat, it's basically maybe not quite so extreme, but like a Russian imperial stout, because you really want to forget what happened. And uh, I think, you know, alcohol is a great vehicle for showing culture, too, because, I mean, there's a lot of ritual. I mean, like, you know, the, the word jungle juice we just heard, you know, um, we all kind of know what that is, even if we have never had it. You know, you know that that's something that's going to get you crazy. Um, and, then, you know, in my culture, the only other thing I can think about off the top of my head that I think is really um, indicative of how alcohol is treated is just um, in that culture, you cannot drink your drink first. You have to have somebody else drink your drink. And that causes uh, a lot of issues when uh, certain characters go to be among the nobility for the first time. And it's it's kind of an issue with, uh, well, do I ask them to drink my drink or do I just go for it, you know? Um, and that's that's sort of where I'm at with it. I think it's kind of a neat, a neat thing to incorporate that into, um, you know, just how, how people think about the world. And you, know, you, you might have your own kind of cultural thing that you're afraid other people don't do. Um, uh, yeah. That's a very cool uh, tidbit there. Uh, Angela, I'm assuming you're probably going to talk about wine. Uh, well, a little bit, I guess. I think the challenge is like, like, you know, you have things like wine and beer, which are sort of generic sounding and lots of different cultures have them, although they make them out of different things. And so I like to, um, I like to do that as a differentiation. Um, kind of thing because uh in my world which is the Aterian empire is very mediterranean but i wanted to make it bigger so it's not just focused on like renaissance on a renaissance italy kind of inspired thing but it's the countries that kind of border but also are connected by trade networks so um there are african um so, you know, cultures that are also connected and, and they all drink different things, but they all kind of mix. And, and one of the challenges I think is that sometimes you can use, like when you're talking about alcohol, like say like vodka, which I have from some of the um, Eastern European like cultures in my book. And then my um, work in progress, I'm writing a portal fantasy which is kind of a cold war portal fantasy and the main character is the son of russian defectors but it's an epic so when they go through the portal it's a new place and i wanted stuff that similar to vodka but vodka is a very that's a russian word you know like if you want to it doesn't like transfer into the fantasy so i tend to make up stuff let's basically like a thing that i want but i'll make up a name um and I think I get in some other stories that into more of a, I'll have to, I have to sometimes go research like how they make things like, you know, cause we don't know so much. And then if you're going into a traditional and a pre-industrial world, like, you know, like, well, how did they do these things? When did distilled alcohol? I probably get way too much into the weeds in terms of details, but it, it does inspire me to write certain kinds. I might only use a little bit, but, you know, like I, I did kind of try to think about, it's like, well, vodka's distilled and how did they do that? 
like, you know, pre factory stuff, you know, so I, I did, I researched like traditional vodka making and when it came and it was actually introduced by the Italians to the Russians. So, oh. <laughs> um, which was kind of a weird thing. And, um, anyway, I've got a story that, that'll have like some of that involved like the the making of stuff but but like you said it's more toward the character thing it's like the it's it's like the vehicle that you use to um not just illustrate character but promote plot and develop character too right like they say that any element that you use in a story should have multiple purposes every sentence etc um Excellent. Well, you kind of uh, led me directly into the next uh, topic, which is naming conventions. Since you mentioned how you were coming up with a name for vodka that was a little bit different. I want to start with Lex on this one. How do you pick names for characters, places, et cetera, that enhance the world building, that add to the atmosphere, et cetera? A lot of the places that I write about are inspired by my childhood and where I grew up. Um, I grew up on Long Island and a whole bunch of, I do a lot of like beachy kind of stuff, a lot of small town kind of stuff, a lot of farmland kind of stuff, and it all kind of exists on Long Island. So I've had those different experiences, um, but a lot of it for me is also just making sure that it makes sense for the world and also the time period. I write a lot of historical fiction um, and you wind up with these things um, like the Tiffany problem where Tiffany is a medieval name, but if you wrote a medieval story and named a character Tiffany, <laughs> nobody would buy it. So it's sort of things like that of being aware of where you are in history and would this name be a thing? Would anybody know what this particular brand is at this point? Would this kind of technology be in use yet or would it be outdated by now? Um, different things like that are all all come into account. Yeah, that's hilarious what you say, because um, I think people are always worried about being historically accurate. But as you pointed out, sometimes if you're too historically accurate, then a modern reader is not going to get what you're what you're talking about. Exactly. Uh, Mike, how do you come up with uh, names for places, characters, etc.? Uh, sure. So uh, when it comes to places and, uh, you know, map building type things, sometimes I'll try to come up with uh, words that sound the same, uh, either based on um, things I've seen or other languages. Um, but what I'll do is I'll try to keep like commonalities and I may not know what they mean at the time, but then I'll kind of go back and think about it. So um, the uh, the region of my world that the first book that I wrote, The Traders We Are, takes place in, um, takes place in a place called Harfall. Um, and uh, there's a few different regions of that area. So I kind of thought about like, well, what does har mean? And does, you know, is, um, is there something way to break down that word, you know, harfall, you know? And then uh, when it comes to like uh, character names, a lot of times I'll look for a culture that, you know, maybe the names I can kind of get, you know, riff off of, um, you know, speaking of uh, character names with this slightly change that I thought of, what is the most obnoxious rich person thing to do for the, the rich area of the world? And I thought, it's to just add one letter to a character name. So there's a there's a character um, that's super obnoxious named Greg. It's just Greg with an extra I in there. And there's something about that that is just so horrible. And like, you could tell like what this dude is about just from his name, you know? I hate him already. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Uh, Angela, tell us about your uh, naming conventions. Um, I actually, oh, actually did before, before you start, I just want to mention to the audience that in about 10 or so minutes, we're going to be taking uh, some questions. So if you have questions you want to ask panelists, pop them in the chat. All right, go ahead, Angela. Um, I actually did a Twitter poll once because I was wondering, because sometimes, you know, you get feedback and you're like, oh, well, there's there's too many names in this because I do tend to like try to name a whole lot of things. And then, but I was just wondering like, what kind of level do people think is like optimal for what, you know, like this many, in world names is good, but this is too many. And, and, or maybe you should name all your place names as being sort of English names instead of made up ones. And it was interesting because in most people, the results were that most people liked a mix, you know, that some names they wanted to be kind of easily understandable. Like, you know, that, that place is 
I have a place called in my new book that I'm writing right now called um, Crooked Poplar. So, you know, like you have names like that and then you have like totally made up names too to give like a sense of the world. So I thought that was interesting. I don't know if I actually will ever try to hit that balance, but um, but it was kind of interesting to me to say that because when I, my place names are sometimes hard to come up with for me because I'll just put placeholder names in. I'll be like, well, they're going to that town over there and I'll make stuff up and then I like have to come back and figure out maybe it needs a better name I do try to have names that like kind of fit with a language that kind of like the sound of it is more similar than other ones and um for so I often do look at other languages and then especially for character names that either have meanings that I like or I just like the sound of them and then I do I'll transpose letters and and try to come up with something because and especially with character names like if I have to change the character name I totally change the character it's a new person so I you know they have to fit um so I do spend quite a lot of time doing that but I'm not sure I have a it's not systematic it's just sort of more of a well that feels right so I guess I'll use it yeah I know what you mean I'm sure that most writers especially in the science fiction and fantasy realm spend a lot of time on like baby name generators for different languages like you know 100 most common German names or Chinese names or whatever yeah. um, speaking of names uh, Noah since you mentioned that you write epic fantasy with way too many names uh, how the hell do you keep all those straight so um so the God Surf series is uh based on a on a vaguely Mediterranean society. Um, there's a lot of uh, Greek sounding names and um, and then occasional occasional other things. Um, so um, there's a few things I I tend to do. I like to um, I like to play around with turning Hebrew words into um, into other names. Um, so or 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 passing something through Hebrew to get somewhere. So for example, um, I wanted to have a sun god, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, let's start with um, the Egyptian sun god, Aten. Um, but yep. let's connect that his city is gonna be named after him. So I, t uh, and the way you say Athens in Hebrew is Atuna. So I was like, okay. okay, let's rename, let's make this sun god Atun with a U and his city is Atuna. And then a lot of people get, end up, you know, who, who live near there have names that are in some way have, have Atun in them, right? Because in Hebrew, there are a ton of names that have El in them, right? Which means God that have Shaddai in them which means God, <laughs> you know, there's like, so any, if you're named Michael, it's because it, you know, your name means who is like God, you know? And if your name is, you know, Raphael, it's because your name means God heals. And if your name, you know, so there, you know, all, all people's names, like a lot of them just have, you know, the God's um, name uh, hidden in them somewhere. Um, and the other thing is that um, all the gods in my world have sacred animals. Um, and so I could all I could if I wanted to research, you know, sort of the, the scientific names of various animals and give people versions of that. Right. So um, so a uh, there's a character called Tara P.T.E.R.A. Right. Because because her her. Uh, god is a raven god, right? And and so that her name means wing, right? And so there, there, I I researched a lot of names like that, and and um, and so you got people with moth names and and uh, squid names and all sorts of things like that, um, in order to to remind me who they are and why they're there, um, <laughs> and at the same time. Um, be a cool sounding name that you probably haven't heard, right? Right, and an attentive reader will probably be like, oh, wait a minute, I see what that is. So it's fun to leave those little nuggets in there for them. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, when I also, you're not really, a, are you really an epic fantasy writer if you don't go extra hard on the names? Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so we have about, uh, in a few minutes, we're gonna take a few audience questions. I actually don't see a ton right now. So um, uh, we will uh, we'll come back to, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them. We have a few more of our own that we haven't got to yet. So, uh, but I wanna talk about um, long distance communication. Uh, when I originally saw the topic, I was like epistolary, what, what is that? What? And then I was like, oh, wait a minute. It's not just letters, but you know, how do they communicate in the world? Do they have uh, you know, ravens that send messages? Is there a magical email? I mean, how does that all work? Uh, I'm fascinated to know. So Mike, you wanna get us started with this? Sure, so um, my setting is fairly low magic. Um, I get somehow get labeled uh, high fantasy a lot. And I, I don't know that that's exactly accurate. I'd say it's more like middle medium fantasy. Um, but it does present unique challenges because when somebody dies, everything they've ever written disappears. So um, in chapter three, one of my favorite moments is um, basically when you get mail, your name is written by the mail carrier on your packet of letters and then uh, delivered to you. And on top of the point of view character's letters is a blank letter. So she runs home and she has a collection of signatures that people have written for her so she can see who's alive and who's dead. And instead of seeing one name disappeared, she sees that there are two names that have disappeared. That creates a little bit of intrigue for the story. Um, you know, in the reach, which is a poor region, they just have, you know, mail carriers um, in the, uh, the crownlands and the, uh, the areas closer to the civilization uh, and society. They have scribes that will maybe even write your letter again for you. Um, that way, you know, it, it doesn't disappear. And I haven't covered this in the books yet, but there are a few other places that kind of deal with that in different ways. The Hattori, um, which are a Southern uh, culture, they do not use writing because it disappears. And I was listening to a podcast and it talked about how, and I, it's, I think it's an indigenous people in Central America used to use beads and knots uh, to communicate. So they do that it's a, and it stays there when they die, but it's not, it's a very concrete language. It's very mathematical. And then in another region of the world, they actually view it as a sin to write anything down because if humans were meant to write things down, it wouldn't disappear. So um, I'm still kind of figuring out how they, I think that they're going to have traveling speakers that are the way that they communicate. Um, but I haven't worked that one out yet. I'm still kind of workshopping how that's going to, how that's going to go. Very cool. And the, the, the uh, letters disappear via some sort of magic? Uh, sort of. I don't, uh, well, like it's kind of spoiler. Okay, so, okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, they, it's it's just a function of the world. So like, in this, you know, I, I play Dungeons and Dragons in the same setting and my players always ask me questions like, okay, so if I painted a painting and I signed it, would the whole painting disappear? And no, only the letters would disappear. Okay, intriguing. Well, I guess we'll have to read that book to find out. Uh, Angela, how do they communicate long distance in, uh, in your... Well, obviously it's going to be different with your new portal fantasy, but um, <laughs> talk about the books, the books that are currently out. First. The books that are currently out, the Utarian Empire books. I mean, we I've got letters um, in them and journals and just kind of, you know, like typical stuff. But um, they also, there's an element of magic involved as well, um, because I've got, and it differs by culture to some extent, because um, one of my characters who's um, from um, an African-based um, culture, he actually, his is a little different. So he actually uses ravens that uh, travel through sort of a magical space in order to get things. They carry letters. They don't actually speak or, or anything, but they, they do carry letters. So they can carry letters much faster than they, it would normally take because um, it takes months, um, sometimes longer than that to, to actually get from um, a, down where he's from to, to up into, and into the Italian peninsula. So I had to try to figure out a way that they could actually communicate a little bit um, more, uh, faster. The, the problem is that ravens are a kind of a bird that is also used by a god that um, is kind of a scheming god and, and, and is in conflict with, um, at, well, both of the main characters, but one of the, the, the male main character um, particularly. So whenever he gets something, it sees a raven, it freaks him out. And he um, is never quite sure if he's getting the real message or something that's been twisted by the god who 
really doesn't like him very much. So um, there's that. And there's also and then the other form of magic, which uh, and it come, becomes more as the series goes on, is um, they can kind of communicate and they don't really communicate, but they can kind of see things that are happening in other places. It's not always controllable through dreams and visions, um, often through things like mirrors, um, reflective surfaces in the water. Um, so my main character, Kira, uh, her magic is something that she can't control. It comes and goes and she has absolutely no control over it. Um, she can see things that are happening. She can't control what she sees. She doesn't know when it's happening. She doesn't know where it's happening. Sometimes she just knows that it's a thing that she, she, she gets. And so it, it kind of like makes it, it's not really epistolary. It's more like, I don't know, it'd be like if you suddenly got a video in front of you and you could watch something and, and then you were like, but what the heck does that mean? Um, so TikTok basically. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> then you have to try to put together the context around it, and 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 if you don't put the context together right, then it's it's going to lead you off into some directions that probably you shouldn't have gone into. That's brilliant. Uh, and how about you, uh, Noah? Um, so the in in the God Surfs, there's it's mostly like a messenger based system. If you're gonna if you're going to to have long distance communication, you've got to send somebody to send your message. Um, but um, in terms of written language, the the big differentiator is that uh, about half of my characters are illiterate, um, and so it's a it's a class issue. Um, who can read? What they think of reading? I have one character who's um, was essentially raised by wolves and who thinks that uh, reading is freaky. Um, and she's convinced that um, when a friend of hers reads aloud, that it's um, some kind of spirit in the book taking control of her body and talking through her. Um, and that when she reads silently, the spirit is trying to steal her soul away. Um, and so <laughs> she, she is, uh, you know, aggressively anti-reading um, for quite some time. And it, it takes, you know, like three books for her to, to learn how to read anything. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Someone in the chat said, sounds like my students for anyone who didn't notice that. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so that's a, you know, that's a big differentiator. We have, we have you know, some characters who are, who are self-conscious of the fact that they cannot read and others can. And we have some characters like her who are just like, what the hell is this about? You know, dead people should not be able to talk through you or anyone, right? And, uh, and <laughs> so, so uh, there's that. And then, you know, now and then we have, we have, um, there, there's, you know, the, the, um, the, practice of academic wizardry, which is, um, which is, you know, all, mostly gone by the time the characters come around, but they're, they uh, come across it now and then, and then, you know, the, they'll be like, ooh, you know, we found some ancient scroll, you know, maybe one of, one of us can like read it and figure out something about this prophecy concerning us and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the, the most voracious reader among them picks it up and starts reading aloud, and it is some dry, like, scientific abstract about like, you know, in this experiment, we tried, you know, this kind of magic and that kind of magic and that kind of magic and that kind of magic, you know, none of these terms mean anything to them, <laughs> you know, and, and we wanted to see which is most effective at it's like, okay, throw that scroll away. Let's see if the next one has anything good. Uh, you clearly have an epic fantasy writer's uh, imagination. For sure. Uh, how about you, Lex? What uh, what kind of long distance communication? I imagine in some cases you might have like actual text messages, but uh, tell us about how you use uh, epistolary and other forms of communication. Yeah, so um, sometimes there's text messages. Again, it depends on what time period I'm writing in. Um, for the island kind of dystopia world, um, they kind of lose, the whole theme is isolation. So they kind of lose all of that communication. They have a radio for a while. 
Um, they have a mail service that comes for a while and then stops showing up. So they have to rely on the radio a bit more. That signal goes out. And at that point, they're kind of, they consider trying to train seagulls as like carrier pigeons and then dismiss that because seagulls are mean and just decide <laughs> to go themselves um, and, and try to communicate with the mainland um, and figure out how all of that is going to go. Um, and by leaving, they completely cut themselves off from their island community because there's no way to contact back. So in some ways, the lack of long distance communication is the main feature of that world. Yes. Uh, and does that does it drive into um, in some ways like closer uh, personal relationships or the more important uh, because you can't communicate with anybody that's not right in front of you? Definitely, but it's also a little bit of um, do you like the people that you're around and what happens if you don't or what happens if you can't if somebody is out of control? How do you try to control them when you have no system to back you up? Right. Uh, well, we are going to get into a couple. Of, we have a couple of questions in the chat, and then I have. I'm going to ask uh, one or two more. Uh, I'm scrolling up to find the one. Uh, where did it go? Oh yeah. So uh, someone named Jr. Bourneville asks, "How do you weed out bad names from those more fitting? It's all too easy to come up with things that sound great but actually aren't." Would anyone like to chime in on this one, Will? I mean, first off, it's always a good practice to Google your name that you chose and make sure it doesn't mean anything horrible um, in some other language. See, hundred percent. Uh, you know, <laughs> just, just, you know, and 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 having beta readers, especially ones who who are multilingual, is also helpful. You know, um, you, obviously, you can't. You can't do everything. And sometimes, you know, it happens in our real world that, you know, a name in one language means something dreadful in another. Um, it happens all the time. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you try to do some due diligence when you're making up a name to make sure that the name you've made up is not also something very, very different. I can certainly co sign that. And you reminded me of I have a, I teach French and I have a student named Nick. And boy, if you uh, turn that into a French word, uh, it's not a nice thing to say. Uh, anybody else have a comment on the question of uh, avoiding bad names? Um, also, you can read it. You can try to say it aloud, too, because, you know, a lot of times when we're putting letters together and we don't actually try to say them, um, you know, sometimes you can end up with names that don't really aren't pronounceable. So that's a thing. Uh, imagine like, you're recording your own audiobook and make sure that you can pronounce your name and that it doesn't suck. Right. Because then you're trying to get like then when when somebody, you know, the narrator for the audiobook says, How do you say this? And you're like, Well, um, I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> I could, yeah. So read your stuff aloud. <laughs> oh, I'm 100% with you. People ask me, like, how do you pronounce this character's name? Like, I don't know. It's a fantasy book. Like, that's your job as a reader. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have a comment on the avoiding the bad names? You know, I think, you know, reading it over and over again, you'll kind of get a feel for what's good and what's bad. Um, I, you know, I agree with the other readers. My wife read my book and she actually was like, you're pronouncing this name wrong. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, shoot. Um, <laughs> And like, you know, similarly with, you know, that does happen in real life. So maybe it could be a good moment if it does mean something different in a different language. Like I, um, I'm not sure how it's spelled, but I remember when I was in a band, uh, there was this band that would come through and the guy was from a, a different country and his name was pronounced like poopy. And it's like John over, or I think it's supposed, I think it's spelled like Popeye maybe. Um, but like, you know, he's like, Oh, you know, my, my country, that's, that's pronounced, that's basically like John. And, you know, it was a funny moment and you know like we didn't give him a hard time or anything about it but it just it just kind of was shocking and i think sometimes that culture shock is a good realistic thing to have you know sometimes it's good to have those those weird times where you're like that is an interesting name you know i i want to mention before i forget that um another thing that comes up is uh not giving your characters names that are too similar to each other um yeah, because and unless they have the same name, which is also OK, right? Like people, common names exist and sometimes people have the same name. But like then you can say like that one as opposed to the, you know, you can differentiate them somehow. Right. 
tall Joe as opposed to short Joe or whatever. Or right? give them different nicknames or things right. like that. Different nicknames, yeah. et cetera, right? You can, you can give half of your characters the same name and they all go by different nicknames, right? But um, I, I've definitely had to change character names sometimes, even though they were, you know, this was in, in the, uh, the Coward's War where they were real names. Um, but then I realized like they start with the same letter, like they're the, you know, I don't, I don't want people mixing up these characters. Um, so I had to just change one of their names to be something totally different that didn't look too similar because you don't want people to mix your characters up. It's hard enough when you have too many names um, to have some of them be too similar to each other. Epic fantasy writers take note. It's, it's tough. And, and it's like when you get so many names too, it's not even if they sound similar to each other, if they just start with the same letter. Because yep. sometimes people just will be reading, they're like, ah, there's three characters that start with letter A, which one am That's I right. reading about now? So, mm -hmm. you know, and then you have like, I write really big books and it's, a, you know, and then you have end up with the cast of thousands. You're like, there are only so many letters in the <laughs> alphabet that I can use to start a name. So, yeah, it's hard. <laughs> Uh, we have one more question in the chat from someone named Diana Gunn. I don't know who the hell that is. Um, I'm just kidding. She's the organizer of this conference. Uh, how can writers build details like this into their stories? And, and also, like, could you share any research resources you might use uh, other than Google, which I'm sure that we're all good at? Uh, Lex, you want to jump in on this one? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I really like to do, and this isn't really a research thing, but it's more of just understanding your world is just as a writing exercise, not as a scene in the book, not as anything else. Sit down, imagine yourself in your main character's bedroom or your main setting or whatever important place you need to write about and describe it in as much detail as possible. Um, a really good way to start if you're not, if you're like, I have no idea what it would look like is sit down and describe your own room. What details do you notice and try to put that into your world because that's going to help you visualize what things look like and the little details that pop out can end up being important. Like why did you focus on a particular book on the nightstand or why did you focus on this lamp or this piece of clothing that's hanging on a chair? Why are those things important? Right on, Mike. Um, I think to me, like, you know, research for me, I feel like is a little bit different. I do do the thing where I Google things. Um, one of the things I really like to do is I'll listen to podcasts. One of my favorite is uh, Stuff You Should Know. And that's where I came up with the uh, Hattori not writing. And it's just kind of, it's, sometimes it's about finding the spark, um, you know, find the spark everywhere. Like, why is this like this? Um, you know, same way as I play uh, Dungeons and Dragons in the same world, though my book is not based on anything we've played in Dungeons and Dragons. But, you know, naturally these questions come up of, you know, why is this like this? How, you know, the question of why do the names disappear? Um, I think only one or two of my players have actually asked me that. And I've only told one of them because, um, you know, he's uh, he actually runs a game in my the setting as well, which is when I was like, I should I should start writing a book because some of his players wanted to write a book. And I was like, oh, no, you kill that. That's uh, that can't happen. Um, but, you know, that that's a big thing. And I think, you know, just think about like, what do you do every day? Like, you know, do you like board games? What board games do your people play? Um, do they like cards? Um, I think that that is, you know, make it as real life as possible and it will, it will feel true. You know what I mean? Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, we have about five minutes left. And so I might have to cheat uh, Angela and Noah on this question. So you'll forgive me because I want to make sure. Uh, first of all, I neglected, uh, I was neglectful in my duty as a, uh, as a moderator today. I forgot to mention that uh, story crafting sessions are free, but a lot of work goes into making them happen. Please consider making a one-time contribution to help pay for operating and organizing costs. Staying membership uh, is also available. Um, I, I also contribute to that as well. There's a Ko-Fi. It's in the, uh, in the chat here if you want to uh, take a look at that. Um, and can you guys please briefly tell us uh, where they could find you online? And if you have a book uh, out that you'd like to mention, maybe one you've been talking about, but in all this long discussion, they've forgotten what it was called and they really got to go look it up right now. So uh, Angela? Um, okay. Uh, I have a website, which I don't 
um, update that often, but it, you can find me there. It's uh, AngelaBoard.com. Um, otherwise, I'm on Twitter as Angela Board um, fairly regularly. Uh, my book is called Fortune's Fool. Actually, that's book one of the Italian Empire series, which that was the Spiffo Five finalists. Um, I have uh, a novella out in that series too called Smuggler's Fortune. Excellent. And Noah? Uh, I spend too much time on Twitter as n underscore s underscore Dolcart. Um, I do have a website, uh, nsdolcart.com or nsdolcart.wordpress.com. They'll both lead to the same place. Um, and uh, the books that you can buy are uh, the God Surfs series, starting with Silent Hall. Wonderful. And Mike? Sure. Um, my Twitter is, actually, I got to remember what it is. I think it's Mike S. Roberti. It's okay. It's um, in the chat, I think. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. I, uh, I always forget what I put it as, but uh, my books are under Michael Roberti. Right now, I only have out uh, The Traitors We Are. Um, I'm working currently on a book called A Grave for Us All. That is the sequel to that. Uh, and then eventually, uh, Until Worms Remain will be the final uh, part of that trilogy. Wonderful. And uh, Lex, where can we find you? And when can we expect to read uh, more of your work? Yeah, so um, I'm across the internet, just at Lex Vranick everywhere. Um, my website's currently under construction, um, but that'll hopefully be back up again soon. Um, I do have a short story out right now called The Body. It's a bit of a beachy creature feature. So if you're into spooky sirens, um, you can check that out. Um, there's links all across my social media. Excellent. And I am Dan Fitzwright, uh, pretty much wherever you go. Uh, if anyone has a one final thing to say, we had the question of um, uh, one piece of advice. So if you could give a 30 second piece of advice, uh, how about you, uh, Mike, for those world widows out there? 30 seconds okay. or less, go. Stay curious, just be curious. Look at things. Okay. Awesome, uh, Lex? Try new things. If your characters are into something, try your hand at it and see how it actually feels to do that thing. Outstanding, Angela? Um, I actually don't, just read a lot. Um, that would be my, just all kinds of books, memoirs, whatever, just read a lot. Fantastic advice. Uh, Noah? Yeah, people sometimes say, write what you know. It is always an option to learn and know more. 100%. Uh, thank you, Noah, Angela, Mike, and Lex. And big thanks to Diana Gunn. Renaissance Press and uh, Weeknight Writers. Uh this video is a recording of a panel from the event Story Crafting Sessions Fantasy, a free one day virtual conference hosted by the Weeknight Writers Group in partnership with Renaissance Press. To learn more about the Weeknight Writers Group, you can go to businessforauthors.com slash weeknight dash writers. And to learn more about Renaissance Press, you can go to pressesrenaissancepress.ca.